So I'm going to do my best to get through this and give you kind of a synopsis of what you need to know just to kind of figure out how to structure your business. And uh, just to preface, I'm an IP attorney, so my specialty focus is mostly on patents, trademark, copyright. The corporate stuff I understand, but not to the extent of many other corporate attorneys. So I'm going to do my best to kind of give you the rundown. If you have any questions, just feel free to email me, and then I'll give you a lot more, much more detailed answer, you know, for this specific question. Um, but I just want to thank you today for having me here. Um, so my name is Mandy Tran, and I am the owner of the law firm series Patent Technology. Um, it's a boutique law firm that specializes in intellectual property. I uh, help people obtain patents, copyright, trademark, trade dress, other things. Um, I also work on contracts, licensing, and when people get into disputes, I help them resolve that. I've negotiated settlement agreements and also um, licenses. And um, some of the <clears throat> more notable opponents that I've fought in terms of trademark have included Pepsi, Frito-Lay, um, Machine Zone, they actually make the Final Fantasy video games, some of you might know, and other iconic brands. Um, so fortunately, <clears throat> in our case, we won, and so my clients were able to keep their trademark. Um, I just want to start by commending you all for taking this class. I'm sure it's probably a little bit more interesting than some of the other classes you've taken, right? Um, but obviously, there was a curiosity that you had in business that brought you here. So hopefully through this experience, you've been able to have a spark in a, passion, a newfound passion for business. But maybe for some of you, you found out that it might not be for you, but that's okay because you know, when I was in middle school and high school, I was fortunate enough to have grown up in a family business. And um, I learned a lot in terms of wisdom, the um, amount of endurance that, that goes into it. It's really, uh, it, it's one of the most challenging things personally that you can go through in terms of owning a business. And so with that, I've been able to take it into my life in my own business. But I think for many of you, this experience is much like that, you know, and so you'll be able to take that and, and either bring it into your own world in your own business or else contribute to your employees. So this is a very multidimensional experience you're getting. So I do commend you for going through this and I'm sure you've learned a lot about yourself. Um, um, so let me go to this next um, For me, it, you know, I read this book by Bill Gates, and the one thing I took from his one autobiography was this thing about the mission statement. And it took me a long time to kind of find the one thing that captured the spirit of business for me. And recently I found this quote, this Latin phrase, <clears throat> al dente fortuna in bot. And for me it's important because whenever you're in business, you should have some kind of a global perspective of that, that guides your sense of direction and mission. <clears throat> so it, it basically translates to fortune favors the bold, right? In life, you really do have to take it boldly. There's no room for being, you know, there, you can't be shy, you know, it's either you live or you die, really. So um, I would say, it, I, I guess one of the biggest challenges that I've encountered in business, and I, I currently run the company Pro Control, you know, I deal with a, a startup company myself, and I've seen it go through all the challenges of growth, what, what you're kind of going through now, we've been through that already. And as a business owner, you really do have to kind of face your fears, face yourself more than anything else. I mean, if you can't be bold within yourself and, and, and basically give yourself the chance to grow personally, then your business doesn't stand much of a chance because you are your business and you're an entrepreneur. There's really no barrier to, to that um, relationship. So um, I analogize oftentimes business with have, being a parent-child relationship or um, a farmer you know, with its field or, or a ship captain to a ship. Um, you are basically tasked with the, uh, you're, you're tasked with the um, role of giving birth to an idea, giving birth to something that's alive, bringing it up from a seed and making sure it comes out into the world in some kind of life form, uh, cultivating it to some uh, sustainable, you know, self-sustaining level, and then making sure that hopefully it can grow and live through your life into the next lifetime. And so in that way, you are a leader. 
right now you are, you know, so in that way I kind of give to you this mission statement to take into the future in your own life to guide you that no matter what, always be important. Um, so I'm going to go now into the law. Um, why do you have a lawyer, why would you have a lawyer, uh, a lawyer in, in an entrepreneurial class? I think that it's pretty obvious that the law is the foundation of everything that you do in business. It's basically, um, it sets, it's the rules of the game and it, having, um, Well, um, why, why would you have a door in, uh, in an entrepreneurship class? Uh, it's basically to, you know, you can't avoid lawyers. Um, the law is the basic construct of all business, all transactions. So uh, it's, it, it's important for you, you know, throughout uh, in business to know a good lawyer. Uh, because eventually, no matter what, it will catch up with you. Even the most perfectly run business is vulnerable to some kind of uh, problem. You know, you might be just fine and then find yourself accidentally infringing on trademark, whatever, or if somebody gets sick, uh, you know, or whatever, employees get into issues and, you know, knowing a lawyer, but eventually you will just have to rely on, on some, an, an expert in the law. i give you a couple small examples. I mean, you know, a lot of times people think big companies have to, are the ones that really only have to worry about lawyers, but I mean, you you start a very you start a small business. You have a contractor come in and do some some work for you, and the work ends up being unsatisfactory. And you've already paid for a portion of it, and then they abandon the job because they maybe get another job that pays more money, and or they do a haphazard job in order to move on. You're stuck stuck holding the bag, and you're a small company, so you can't afford thousands of dollars of rework to be done. So you're going after the first company who didn't do the work properly. You know, you're going to need an attorney for something like that. It's not going to be as simple as saying, hey, you know, this guy didn't do the job. They're going to say, okay, let's look at contracts. Let's look at what you signed. Let's look what you agreed to. You know, and ultimately that starts to become more and more challenging. So no matter the size of the company, you're going to find, you know, a lawyer is going to be a useful thing to have on your uh, contact list. Yeah, some of my smarter clients, and they're even the smart, the, the, the ones who are just starting out, the first thing they do is come to me you know, to consult on what do they need to make sure that they have everything they need outlined and so that they're set up right because if you're set up wrong from the beginning then you run into those holes and vulnerabilities and then you get into those troubles more. And it's more costly if you don't, you know. I, I just, just kind of like, as a, it, it, it's good to be uh, cautious that way and, and, and uh, have somebody on your side that can get, you know, give you advice throughout the whole, you know, your, your growth. Um, I'm sorry, I drank too much coffee this morning, so I'm a little jittery. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so, um, why, right? The, as, as we discussed, the law, you can't avoid lawyers, and in, in, in the law really sets the standard for, for everything you do. You know, I mean, you, you go into the business, whether you're manufacturing or whatever your business you're engaging, or if it's even services. Every, nearly everything is regulated in some way. And so um, it's just good to, uh, my suggestion is not only know a good lawyer, uh, but be familiar with the law, you know, because that way you, you can save yourself money um, and, and headache, but then you, can, uh, you are also able to, uh, to manage your own direction much better. Uh, and, I, I think that like when you when you're familiar with the law, um, then you know you you just have a, a lot more a better grasp of and control of your business, um, and and also are able to strategize much better for yourself as well as take advantage of the experts that are in, in working for you. Um, there's kind of basically three types of law. Uh, that you should consider. There's a federal, there's a federal level of law, the state and international law. Um, the federal law pertains to mostly inter interstate type of activities, things that go on between states. And then the, the state level pertains to what goes on within the state. 
um, a lot of times there's an overlap between the various you know, levels of law. And then international law pertains to mostly the engagement of, uh, between countries and their agreements as to how to regulate certain types of business activities. So say you start off with the endeavor of wanting to um, provide, create a, a, a local business for producing fertilizer, right, on, your, on a piece of land. So you, you have to go to your local state government to get permits for that. Um, and then you decide you're going to transport that across state lines to the neighboring states. And in that way, you have to be mindful of the permits um, and the regulations that go into transport across state lines, um, as well as maybe involving uh, Clean Water Act and other types of rules relating to the type of business that you're engaging in. And then say you decide that you're going to sell that internationally to China or wherever and other countries. Um, there may be treaties involved that re that regards, um, you know, what type of material goes through, uh, how much, you know, what the quality is. So, when you're whatever business that you're dealing in, you have to kind of look at um, all the kind of red tape that you have to get through to get to where you got to go. So that if you know if you know that there's a red tape there, you at least can anticipate how to get around it. Sometimes that will affect how you design something, something or how you package it, how you market it even, you know. So uh, that's, that's important to know. There's also two, two, type, two kind of levels of law as well in terms of statutory and common law, just to be mindful because, just because it's not written in the books, you know, by statute, you know, which is created by legislature, doesn't mean that you don't have some type of law that applies to you. Um, common law is something that's created oftentimes where areas of law that, um, are just so variable that you know legislatures have a difficult time creating actual concrete law. Um, it sometimes it just comes through a matter of history, through court cases, and so where there's no statutory law that applies to any particular thing, just know that there's some type of common law that will apply. So just be mindful of that. Uh, oftentimes you'll be in a situation with a contract where you forgot to write something into it, or maybe you didn't even have a contract agreement between you about something. Um, and maybe the statutes don't provide for that. Um, there might be some type of, of, of a legal remedy in common law that may apply, but it's just a lot more costly because it's not so black and white. Um, let's see. Regulated aspects of commercial life as a summary, and it goes into, you probably are familiar with this, just about everything is regulated. Uh, tangible properties, liabilities, employment, family, Criminality. These are the things about business that are affected, you know, by regulation. Um, so, when you create your business, where you know, right now you're just kind of coming up with a product or a service. These are all the things, though, that you have to kind of anticipate. Um, how do I protect my property? Uh, how do I protect my ideas? What type of liabilities do I have to anticipate? You know, how do I handle my employees? And, um, and any risk there. Even with family, there are businesses where a couple, you know, a partner will come in and they're married and they have to anticipate the potential for divorce and how that will affect the business. There are, you know, taxes. Um, so all these things you will probably sort of run into and uh, you can probably discuss between yourself um, as a consideration. Um, business is very risky, obviously. Um, There's really no guarantee, first of all, of success, and there's no guarantee that you won't get into some type of, um, uh, that you'll go through a whole entire lifetime of business and not run into you know, any type of issue. You're always vulnerable because you're way out there as a business. You're out in the public and you're fully exposed. You can get sued really for just about anything. Uh, people can be just vindictive and just file frivolous lawsuits, and I've seen that happen. Um, a lot of times you just, you know, you could be in a situation like right now where you could be a perfectly running business and then you get hit by, you know, a global pandemic and now the, the borders are shut down and people can't travel to Europe, you know. So I, I've talked to now a few of my clients where all of a sudden they have to kind of stop what they're doing and go have conferences of how to deal with employee travel and, you 
know, sick leave and all these other things, and the government is transitioning. So other things that kind of come into play is just the government is another element that 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 affects your company, that can kind of affect a company. You know, even taxes. Like if every administ if pre every other uh, president uh, that we presidential administration, there's always new proposals on taxes, and so. There's some, you know, nothing is fully consistent. The law tries to do its best to kind of iron, keep things ironed out for long-term stability and security of knowing, you know, how to strategize your business. But you'll run into some variability, and so these things are, are things that you have to account for, that you have to adjust to, that will cost you money and time, you know, and so these are things that business do have to plan for in some way, you know, some type of, uh, Risk, manage risk management in terms of various different laws. Although I'm sure people really didn't anticipate a pandemic to come through you know, right now, but it's crazy. Um, let's see, so how do we manage these risks as a business, right? Um, obviously, some things like catastrophes you can't control fully, but yet there are contracts most contracts will have standard language in there that has sort of an out for in case of natural disasters that the obligations may be able to cease. You know, so in your contracts you have things written to anticipate all these various types of scenarios. Um, probably why contracts turn out to be 20 pages long oftentimes. There's also in terms of how a company is structured can help to sh shield you from many liabilities uh, to the company and protect you personally from, from those liabilities, uh, uh, being personally liable for the, the things that go on in the company. Um, property, you know, in terms of your actual property, you have insurance, there's patents, intellectual property protection, you want to register what the inventions you have so that other people can't steal, so that really kind of closes some of those risks. So that way, um, uh, and registrations, right? If you have something like your your chiropractor, well, you want to make sure that you're going to get yourself certified. Uh, you know, get the proper licenses. You just don't go out there and do and just run your business. I, I recently, I'm I'm also part of the planning commission in the town, and recently we had this one business come through, and I was really shocked, right? Uh, they were like a year and a half into running their fertilizer business, and they got, they they sh <laughs> they were violating state and, and local laws. And they didn't really care, and so now they have they're like full running. They have employees, you know, contractors. All these contract, all this money and obligation, the people that are on the line to make a, you know, to be a part of this business, and now they're at risk of being shut down by the DNR. I mean, so all these registration, you can't really be so arrogant as to not um, take all of the <coughs> precautions to manage all the risk and. and Dot your, you know, I's and cross your teeth when it comes to running business. Um, so, let's see. Do I have anything else to say about that? Um, yeah, so I, that's, I, I think it's pretty kind of, you know, common sense here as far as, you know, managing your risk um, uh, and, and why you should do that. Um, so, going into business structures, um, there are when you when you engage in business, you're really personally vulnerable, you know. And, and the law is set up in, in, by statute to provide for certain types of organizations that allow people to be protected personally from uh, what you know the the. Uh, the activities that they engage in because um, if you're just a sole proprietor and you go out and you sell something um, you're you're fully exposed you know if I were to sell a paper tip clip a paper clip to you know some person and they take it home and their kid swallows it and dies then you know without any um, if, if I'm not properly structured I'm fully responsible um, my assets, my property, I would have to pay out for all the, for that type of damage. Um, so, managing risk with a business structure is important. Um, 
the two most exposed type of structures are, are the sole proprietor and the, and the general partnerships. And then the other types that are protective is the LLC, LLP, and corporation. Each state will have its own kind of separate bodies of law in terms of what is required to form any of those types of uh, organization. And, uh, and of course, you know, they, they, their benefits will vary and for whatever purpose, you know, what your projected type of uh, growth, you know, what you anticipate to achieve in your business will determine whether or not you should go with maybe the smaller type of organization or the, you know, or whether or not to incorporate. Um, and uh, there's this website here that kind of gives you some information on that. All right, can I, I'll jump in here as well. And this is probably the first spot where you have to really think about um, which route you're, you're gonna go as a group, okay? Um, you know, sole proprietorships and general par partnerships, probably most of you are gonna, you would think about out of these two is gonna be a partnership, right? Um, but if you're a group of two, a partnership agreement's a lot easier to write. Mm -hmm. You're a group of three, it becomes a little messier. You're a group of four, it starts to get really rough. Because ultimately everybody's gonna have their own personal interests as well as business interests in mind and then on top of it, how do you how do you divvy up the liability? How do you divvy up the the revenue? Uh, becomes a real a real scenario. And realize that in a lot of partnership or in the possibility of partnership agreement is maybe you're going to be a little bit more financially better off than your partners. You know, does that mean that ultimately at the end of the day, let's say the business fails and now you have debt and you file for bankruptcy, do you think that it works that if it's two people, it's just 50-50 all the time? Of course not. Like they can come after the person who has more financial uh, backing or more equity in their own personal life because you know partnerships and sole proprietorships provide what's called unlimited liability, meaning that if you can't cover your business expenses, they show up at your house. They repossess cars, they repossess houses, they empty out savings accounts, they garnish wages until you take care of all those things. Now you might say, well, why would anyone ever do any of this? Well realize that they're also a lot easier to set up. Yes. I can start a sole proprietorship this afternoon if you'd like me to. I can hang a shingle outside, I can put some advertising out there, and just basically let, it, let the business be one of the ways I make money and have it included in my personal income taxes. Corporations, a little messier to set up, but they provide you that protection. You know, If you're dealing in a situation where, like say for example with food or contracts or employment, Things of that sort where you, there's always that possibility maybe you would get sued. You know, a corporate structure allows them to sue the business but not be able to come after you personally. They're not going to show up at your door and, you know, say, hey, you know, the business is folded and I'm still out money so I want you to give it to me out of your personal accounts. So, you know, and obviously like an LLC versus an LLP, a limited liability corporation, a limited liability partnership. You know, again, that, that website will help kind of, kind of divvy out the differences between those two. But that is real, realistically one of the first things you need to think about. Because when you're small, and you can evolve, that's also probably worthwhile to point out, is a lot of businesses will start off as sole proprietorships, they get bigger, they take on a partner for more financial backing. They go, and they maybe bring in some more, now they need to think about corporate structure to make it easier to, to manage. Um, but that first step out the door, you have to think about really what are the advantages and disadvantages of each to make that decision. Yeah. The sole proprietorship and the general partnership is basically I'm just going to go and do something. And um, where, you know, uh, without any protection, it's like jumping off a plane without an, uh, like a, you know, any, you know, anything to kind of hold you back, but um, without a parachute. But, you know, any sole proprietor could become, could basically register as an LLC or incorporate. You know, you could be one person and incorporate or get any of those other level of protection. It's really, really easy to do. I almost think that people who don't are just being reckless or maybe they just underestimate their, you know, their position in the world. They could be, you know, somebody who's opening up a little bakery and selling at the farmer's market thinking that they're not connected so much to the world, but, you know, you're fully liable and the world is right in front of you. So um, it makes sense to to seek to register your company in some form. 
Um, I mean, we'll get into that. As, she, as she moves here, I mean, to give you an example, when I ran my baseball team, you know, first thing I did is I, when I bought it, I bought it, it was a sole proprietorship, and the first thing I did is turn it into a C Corp. Yeah. And the reason why I did that, I started thinking about ways in which we could get sued. Someone hits a fall ball, smacks someone in the head, it's my team, now I'm liable. You know, now I'm paying medical bills for someone else. Well, instead, I'd rather that you try to come after the team and worse come to worse is you totally <laughs> financially ruin the, the team, but I'm not necessarily personally liable and it's not going to take into my personal life necessarily. Yep. Uh, and so, exactly, I mean, um, I'm just going to skip through some of this. Like the sole proprietorship, as we already discussed, this form. you go out there, you just sell something, or your services without any protection. You take uh, the, in terms of taxes, you claim it under your social security, you know, you are the business and you're fully exposed. Um, same with a general partnership, it's basically, you know, two people get into an agreement uh, to, to engage in business. Um, the thing about a partnership is you should be wary. Um, it could be created on paper um, by agreement, Verbally, you know, you just say we're, we're agreeing to be a partner, or it could be done by action. Somebody could just contribute by money or by their time, and over time it becomes significant enough to where they have a stake in the company in terms of a partnership. Um, there's such a thing as an accidental partnership. You should be careful because, you know, a lot of times people kind of have coffee together, come up with a great idea, brainstorm. And then you know the invention. There's a co-invention that kind of happens in during that in, in that kind of like you know awesome moment of you know brainstorming. And then uh, then they kind of have conversations. But maybe <coughs> one guy is thinking, "This is my business. I'm gonna form everything on my own. There's nothing written." And before you know it, the other person feels like they've put so much time into that they are part of the business. And so this person A has found himself with an accidental partnership with person B. And so it's really important when you do business to kind of be mindful of your relationship with everyone that you discuss it with. Either don't discuss it with people unless you intend for them to be a part of it. And if you do, you have to think about like, what's the capacity of that person? A lot of times these things happen at an early stage. You find yourself engaged and entangled in these relationships that were not intended. And you weren't really clear yourself where you stood. And so it's not like you could say, I want you to be this, have this role in my company. But Maybe even if, but, but not knowing how you want to be in a relationship with other people, just knowing how to interact and be cautious about it will prevent you from getting sucked into these kind of kinds of entanglements. I'll give you another, it, I'll yeah. give you another real example here. So, you know, we've talked about what, what the business I'm trying to help will start, right? And ultimately, one of the things he's doing is he re he's relying upon these two people who are providing a lot of his marketing and his web and whatever else. And I keep telling them that I'm really worried about that exact same thing happening because, like, we ask them for administrative ability to get, like, the email address and password for their general inquiry web, like, email address so that we could use it for, like, doing some of the things he's asking us to do. He, the guy who's controlling all that stuff, he's like, I can just have it forwarded to you, but I don't want you to, I, I'm not going to give you guys access so you can reply from this email address. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll do all your artwork for you because I'm a really nice guy and I'm going to do all your artwork for you. But if you need something, come get it from me. I'm not going to just give it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you give away control. On the basis and, of that. and so he's got this spot where he owns a business, yeah. but he's not, even control, he's not even in control of his own brand right now. Yeah. And oh, that yeah. can easily turn into something like this where down the road this business becomes successful. And then the person goes, well, I did all this work for you in the beginning. Therefore, I deserve I would part say of your that business. If you ever were to engage at any level, pay for anyone for services, even a healthy prototype, always have a contract. You know, have some kind of agreement that says you're not an employee, you're, you know, you're not an agent, you're just an independent contractor. You know, and over time, as you develop those relationships and trust between each other and familiarity, then you can kind of maybe give them a greater role in the business together, but um, it's always good to start very conservative and, and you know, with less. Um, in terms of fiduciary duty, here it was kind of structured under a partnership, but really it's a policy that applies to pretty much any kind of situation where people are responsible uh, for the, a company at, at an ownership or agency level. 
Um, also, uh, licensed professionals like accountants and lawyers are responsible for businesses too. And so the duty exists in sort of ubiquitous um, for the most part. In the context of a partnership, the fiduciary duty is basically between the owners, you know, their, their responsibility to each other, um, the loyalty and truthfulness to the company. Technically, I mean, basically, it's like don't do anything that's going to harm your 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 business and, and your partnership. You know, don't go and double deal. You can't be in two different competing businesses and not at the same time in terms of owning them. You can't go and steal the clients from one business and then use it for your own personal use. So it's just a matter of loyalty, and it, you have it, oftentimes, um, even though it's sort of a something that's defined in common law, you know, it's. Uh, it, it's best to have, you'll find it actually very carefully outlined in contracts so that that way it gives clarity. Um, sometimes there are reasons for certain businesses to have, you know, a lot more uh, detailed and um, strict fiduciary rules. So these are things that I think depending on the type of business you're in, you want to think what is the expectation of bad partners or you know, the CEOs of the officers in the company. Because if you're dealing with really high tech stuff, um, maybe you might want to have these rules outlined more clearly because you, you know, don't want to have people go, the, the likelihood of maybe double dealing and, and disloyalty may happen more in certain types of business than others. Um, so in terms of corporation, there's, it's, it's something that's created, um, the IRS sees a corporation basically as, as an actual business entity. It's treated as sort of a separate person in itself, um, where from the owners, uh, for tax purposes, and also in terms of the ability for a corporation to do certain things um, on, on its own behalf. Um, it's a little bit more of a complex business structure. To create a corporation, um, <clears throat> there's some requirements, the uh, formalities in terms of like having to have a board of directors, um, certain registrations, having regular minutes, having designated officers, and um, usually people incorporate for a variety of reasons. You don't have to be a big company or you know have many shareholders to incorporate, but oftentimes people will do that because they want to go and fundraise and there's this expectation of sort of this higher level of status that comes with being incorporated. Um, it also gives the impression that you are going to go out there and do something a lot more global and national in scale. Um, there's also tax benefits to corporations. Um, <coughs> in terms of that, um, uh, I, I, I don't have that in front of me in terms of the various tax benefits, but I would say that um, maybe sometimes bank, banking institutions will require that you be incorporated. For nonprofits, you know, it just is a much easier way of going because the restrictions for nonprofits won't allow um, for part of the entity to be a for-profit. Um, it it, 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 it kind of does away with some of the cumbersome aspects of uh, that, that people run into when they're setting up certain types of other entities like a nonprofit. Um, but the, the setback with a corporation is, you know, with a C Corp, there's such a thing as a double taxation because it's its own entity, it has to pay its own income tax, corporate level income tax. So the corporation has to pay its own taxes. And then after that, the the money in terms of distribution that, that go, gets paid to the shareholders the shareholders then pay those taxes personally. So for every dollar made by a corporation, it gets paid once at the corporate level and, it's, and then the second time at the person level. So there's money that's lost in, in the process you know, for the income that's made from the company. And in that way, <coughs> um, there is the option to avoid that with an S-Corp. Um, if you do qualify as an S-Corp, that's great because you do get the benefits of a corporation, but then uh, the the taxes are allowed to pass through to the shareholders and, and they're able to skip the corporate income tax level of uh, taxation. 
to, but I'll, I'll go into that in a second, in terms of how that works. Um, but as a corporation, even if you don't qualify for, as an S Corp, there, you're, there's flexibility to incorporate in other, in other states. You know, I mean, with an LLC, you kind of have to be, most of the time, a resident uh, of the particular state to register there, whereas with incorporation. With corporations, you have there are some states that allow you to register in their states without being uh, having an office there, and then you get certain benefits from those states that try to bring in those type of businesses into their you know, jurisdiction. So there's some flexibility as a corporation in terms of choice of venue as well, and people think about that because. A lot of times, you, you, for the type of business you're in, sometimes you can anticipate the type of lawsuits that you getting kind of sucked into. And so, <clears throat> knowing, having the flexibility and knowing where you can, you know, set up your business kind of gives you some control over where, which courts you can rely on, you know, to fight for a particular, whatever lawsuit that, that might, you know, run, you run into. And, and the benefits of the, of the courts in those jurisdictions. Um, I just want to make sure I'm good on time, though. Mm -hmm. Am I okay? Yep, Got about ten minutes. Oh, okay. Wow. That's um, with corporate government, the governance, you know, typical. Uh, these are the the body of uh, things that go into uh, a corporation. You have the articles of articles of corporation. You first kind of, you know, it, it's, it recognizes and establishes the entity as being as existing. The bylaws are basically the agreement between shareholders as to their ownership, how their responsibility to the corporation and to each other. Board of directors is set up to basically be a group of shareholders that oversee the business and manage the officers and also the direction of the business. Um, speaking of the double taxation, we kind of spoke about that <clears throat> in terms of the being taxed twice on, on the income of the, com of the company. Um, the, Election as a S corp. Um, if you have you know 100 shareholders or less, and you have one class of stock, and you're a domestic entity, then um, you qualify as an S corp, which basically helps you avoid that double taxation, and you can kind of uh, pay those taxes through your own personal taxes. So then you get taxed once, and you maximize the profits. Uh, with a, can Can you explain what a domestic entity is? Yeah, it's basically a and I guess it varies in terms of which state you're in, you know, they may be, some states are more restricted to say that you have to be um, residents, you know, the people that are part of the company are residents of the state, and others, basically, you're just a U.S. citizen, you know, whereas with a C Corp, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of other foreign share, shareholders or from foreign countries that are part of it. So, say you're fundraising and you're getting money from out of overseas. Um, out of the country, then C Corp would be some. You might not qualify as an S Corp, then C Corp would be the direction to go in that case, based on qualifications. Um, <clears throat> fiduciary duty, much like what I had explained for an S Corp, basically, duty of loyalty, you know, just don't, you just can't do anything to harm the company. Um, you can't compete with the company. Um, you, can steal opportunities, and if you do, uh, oftentimes there are um, provisions in the bylaws or for partnership in terms of the partnership agreements that would could cause you to, you know, lose your ownership rights over the company and even be sued for lost opportunities and damages. So, um, <clears throat> but this is common sense thing. Like, why would you be in a company and try to like cause its own demise? These things happen, so we have to have them because these rules are there. Um, limit liability partnership. <coughs> Excuse me. Sort of an unusual, less common structure of, of business. Um, it's not considered a business entity under IRS rules. They don't see it as its own, um, you know, individual. It's not subject to corporate taxes. But it's sort of this hybrid business. LLPs and LLCs are basically hybrid business organizations. 
that you know recognizes the need maybe at a smaller scale that people don't need such a complex structure to protect themselves and do business. It could be just maybe a more of a local business. Contractor, constructor, even myself, you know, I, I'm, I'm just my own sole proprietor. But then I don't want to be fully exposed, but I want to have the best flexibility to do what I have to do without having to go through all the, you know, regular, the requirements of um, management and having, you know, share with officers and all that. So. It's a, it just gives, it, LOPs and LLCs are basically a state-created um, type of organization by law that gives you personal protection. So LLPs in, is a little different from LLC. It's basically for uh, situations of partnerships um, where you'll find this more with licensed professionals. Um, I have some distinctions. They're, they're, they're basically a, 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 an, a, an organization type that, for partnerships um, that allow them a flexibility to um, engage in their business but be protected from personal liability. Um, the, the, each of the partners are able to manage the company directly and not be personally liable. And um, there's also gives the part of the flexibility for because in certain types of cases like accountants and law firms, the partners are always coming and going, and they are all really very engaged in managing the business. So it it basically allows them to um, to do what they you know in, engage in business with it and and and. In an LLP, each partner is liable for its own part of it, uh, for its own for their own level of negligence, but um, they are shielded from any kind of debt and, and obligations of, of the organization. Um, 